For ALK positive patients who relapse on crizotinib, there are a number of options now. Um, in the past, we really only had standard cytotoxic chemotherapy as an option, but now we actually have several different uh, new targeted therapy options after crizotinib fails, and this really is the class of second-generation inhibitors like seritinib, electinib, and soon in the U.S., we may have brigatinib as an option as well. And so now it's actually become even more complicated uh, to think about uh, choosing among these different pill options for patients. I would say in my own practice um, right now, the standard options are chemotherapy, seritinib, or electinib for patients who fail on, on crizotinib. And typically, we will go with the targeted therapy. We believe the targeted therapy is superior to chemotherapy that's been shown in the first-line setting. And recently, we also presented data on seritinib versus chemotherapy in patients who had failed crizotinib, and we showed that seritinib was superior to chemotherapy in that second line setting. That was the ASCEND-5 trial. So I do believe our, that the targeted therapies are a superior option compared to standard chemotherapy, but I did want to just mention chemo because in case a patient for some reason can't access the targeted therapy, chemo is a reasonable option to use. Among the different targeted therapies, though, in the post crizotinib setting for ALK positive patients, our main choices then are seritinib or electinib. Uh, the efficacy is, is comparable, although again, comparing across trials, there's a suggestion that perhaps the efficacy with electinib may be higher. I would say that the efficacy of electinib in the CNS, in the brain in particular, is definitely higher than that of seritinib, and we've actually shown that electinib can, in fact, um, be active in patients who have failed both crizotinib and seritinib in the brain, so we feel that electinib does have superior intracranial activity. So that could be run one reason that sways us towards selecting electinib in a patient who's relapsing on crizotinib because they have CNS progression. But I would say overall that the side effects um, need to be carefully considered as well. And it's pretty clear from uh, using the drugs and from looking at all the trial data that electinib is overall a better tolerated drug than seritinib. And so I would say for the general patients, even ones who may not have CNS metastases, I think electinib is a preferred option because uh, from a side effect standpoint, it tends to be tolerated better than seritinib. So, you know, again, I think in, in the second line setting, uh, when the patient has failed crizotinib and you're, and you're faced with the choice between seritinib and electinib, um, I think the preferred choice is generally electinib because of its more favorable side effect profile its comparable efficacy and likely its superior efficacy in the central nervous system. Despite electinib's um, generally well-tolerated side effects, though, I have had patients who cannot tolerate electinib. I would say there is a group of patients who will develop significant myalgias and fatigue and weakness on electinib and despite dose reductions to the lowest dose, which is 300 milligrams or half the standard dose, they still cannot tolerate electinib. Those patients for sure would be uh, good candidates for seritinib. And again, I think when we start a patient with on seritinib, we use uh, this alternative dosing, which is the lower dose of 450 milligrams taken with food. So it's important to remember that the ALK rearranged patient population is a small segment of the types of patients uh, oncologists see at large. And so uh, oncologists may not have a broad experience in seeing a lot of these patients and dealing with a lot of the different options that are available. Um, we do have different options available beyond crizotinib, and the most uh, uh, available options right now are two medications. One is called seritinib and one is called electinib. See, these are both very active agents. They get into the CNS uh, in a better way than crizotinib does. How do we choose whether we use one of these drugs over the other? Well, a lot of it has to do with comfort level. If you haven't used any of these drugs before or you've used one of them, you tend to stick with that drug. But I think with each medication, it's about uh, understanding the kinds of things uh, that patients could have in terms of side effects, what kind of adjustments you can make to make these drugs more tolerable. Seritinib was on the scene first, and so that was a medication I think most oncologists have, have had more experience with, um, and often can require dose reductions to deal with GI toxicity, namely. Uh, but when you, when you can use those dose reductions, you can usually maintain patients on, on the therapy for extended periods with good disease control. 
The promise of electinib, and this is the newer therapy uh, for a lot of the regions of the country uh, because of its development occurring a little bit later, uh, the promise of electinib is that it may be a, a bit better tolerated drug with less GI side effects where you don't have to make as many dose reductions. Obviously, I think patients, families, providers want the easiest therapy to give to their patients that works the best. Uh, what we have right now is two very active agents, so we don't know that one works better than the other, uh, but there are differences in toxicity profiles, and then there'll be differences in comfort levels of the providers in terms of, I've always given seritinib, I know how to make dose reductions, or I'm more comfortable with electinib because I don't have to make as many dose reductions, and I think that's where we're at right now. No clear difference in the drugs in terms of how good they are at fighting cancer, but some differences in toxicities. The option for patients who have progressed on crisotinib may include either seritinib or anatinib. However, not all countries have the availability of anatinib at this point. Seritinib has been approved in multiple countries, uh, including in Hong Kong, seritinib is uh, the only one that is approved. So at this moment, I don't have to choose. Now, on the other hand, that you ask the question, you know, what if it's become available, how do you choose? Now, I think the toxicity has to be one consideration. Uh, anatinib, in general, may have less of the GI toxicity. And, but then for seritinib, then there is a new data coming up using the lower dose with the food that they may have equal pharmacokinetic, and that may make the drug a little bit easier to accept. Now, the other important thing is that whether the brain metastasis will make a difference between the two, but certainly the current data suggested that the CNS uh, ability are similar, but then we cannot really have any competitive trial to say one drug is necessarily better than the other one in terms of CNS control. So overall, I don't think we can have any absolute formula to say that I want drug A or drug B. Both are options that's available for the doctor and the patients. When, when you're managing any patient with cancer, for that matter, but specifically uh, an alk rearranged lung cancer, the, the way patients can progress will be different than, say, uh, you manage a patient with more traditional squamous lung cancer or even non-small cell, non uh, non cell lung cancer. Uh, what, what can happen often is you're doing scans and patients are feeling well and you find new lesions in the brain. Well, patients are asymptomatic, so you have a little bit more time to make adjustments. You could continue their oral therapy and maybe use something like radiation to deal with those lesions. Or you could switch to a next generation drug and not use radiation therapy and, and watch those patients for, uh, clo for close periods to make sure there's good control of those lesions. But there can be patients who go downhill rather quickly, who get good control of their cancer, but then slowly start to progress. Maybe you've been watching them, watching that progression occur slowly. Um, and there, there comes a point though where uh, you worry that you may be waiting too long. And so uh, moving on to your next plan of therapy, um, is it's important to have a plan in place so that you're not delaying a patient's opportunity to still benefit from that next line of therapy. Ideally, that next line of therapy is an oral next generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But sometimes you don't, you don't have that option or you don't have the availability or you can't get the drug approved and so you move on to chemotherapy. But that gap there, a lot of uh, oncologists well recognize this gap can be a, a critical period where patients can get sick quickly and, and you hope to restore their health very quickly as well. But it, can, it can't be one of these things where you take many weeks to figure out what you're gonna do.